Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, practical tips for busy commercial lawyers. Uh, my name's Dan Headley. I'm joined by uh, my colleagues Alex Newman, Alex Newman and Steve Murphy. Uh, and if I can persuade the slides to advance, then uh, you might even be able to see some slightly more salubrious photos of us. Apparently not. All right, never mind. Oh no, there we go. Right. So I am going to talk about how to get through commercial contracts quickly, and then I'm going to hand over to uh, Alex and Steve to talk about bringing uh, disputes, particularly tech disputes, which uh, tend to be the more complex side of things, to an end quickly. Um, this will last for about 45 minutes total. I think we're going to talk for about 35 or 40 minutes between us. Uh, there'll be five or 10 minutes at the end for questions, um, which you can submit by, if you hover your mouse pointer over the main presentation window, you should see a little toolbar pop up. And in there, you will find a little button with a couple of speech bubbles and a question mark. And that should bring up a side panel labeled something along the lines of live event Q&A. Um, we are recording this. Uh, you'll be sent a link afterwards, so don't worry about notes or requesting copies of slide decks and so on. You will get those. Uh, since you're all at home, I, I assume you all know where the loons are. Uh, and if you don't, I, I can't help you with that. Uh, so without further ado, we will get cracking. So we've all heard about the promised land of the future of commercial law, about contract automation, working off of your own paper about um, playbooks and self-service templates for the business, tight legal process management to SLAs. There's probably some AI or some blockchain or something in there somewhere. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I've never seen that. Uh, and maybe it exists somewhere. Uh, maybe it only exists in the fevered imagination of Professor Richard Suskind, I don't know. Uh, either way, this talk, isn't about that. It's about the messy, imperfect reality of getting through commercial contracts without losing your mind. And if I can get the wretched slide deck to advance. That looks promising. Yes, it does. So do any of these sound familiar? Um, they tend to manifest themselves in uh, an email sent to you at about five o'clock on a Friday. Uh, typically with a, a red important mark attached to it and maybe with a subject line along the lines of urgent forward forward final final really very final contract. Yeah me too. Point is what do you do about it? Well you can push back on timing sometimes that works sometimes it doesn't. You can try to use your standard paper instead if, if you have it and if it actually fits what the deal is. Uh, you can shove a few reasonablys in here or there and hope the thing never goes anywhere near a courtroom. Uh, or you can just have a breakdown, chuck it all in and go and live on an island somewhere. None of those is really a, an ideal solution. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is what works for me. Some of it will be useful to you. Some of it you will already know. And the thing is, all of you do this job too, so I have no doubt that you've all got your own tricks that you've developed over the years. I don't have all the answers by any means. Uh, this is just an approach that, that works for me. You might be able to cherry pick bits of it. Um, also, you know, I'm not all knowing and within the limitations of this platform, I would very much like this to be as, as interactive as we can make it. So uh, please do stick not only questions in the Q&A, but also sort of observations or tips or tricks that you might have. Uh, and I'll try to share as many of those as I can as we go along. Right, now it seems to be advancing. So here's how I would suggest we split up this 30 minutes. I'm not going to talk for 30 minutes, by the way. This is our 30 minute window to look at this contract. Spend five minutes understanding what the contract is for, the point of it, why we're doing it. Um, spend five minutes basically 
shoving as much of it off onto the business owner as you can. Spend 10 minutes making sure the basics are covered. And I'll come to what I mean by the basics and you'd be amazed how often they aren't. Uh, and spend 10 minutes trawling for red flags. Uh, and in order to do all of that, I'll then talk about some of the tools and the tricks that I use to help me do that as efficiently as possible. So first of all, understanding the point of the contract. And these are basically questions to ask. The first one is what is this contract actually for? Um, the vast majority of commercial contracts are at their heart extremely simple. Somebody is going to do something or supply something and somebody is going to give them some money for doing it. So what are they supplying? What are they doing? It's amazing how often business people don't think the lawyers need to know that. Uh, I think it's absolutely crucial. Equally important, why are we doing it? What's our motivation for getting this thing from this supplier or selling this thing to this customer now? Who is our supplier or our customer? Do, do we know them? Do we trust them? If we trust them, if we've worked with them for years and never had any issues, maybe we're not going to be so worried about the contract because there's, the relationship is good enough there that you know any issues can get sorted out on a golf course somewhere. On the other hand, if we've never worked with them before, maybe we want to be a little bit more careful. How much are we paying or getting paid? Again, that's important not only to you know assessing the materiality of the contract, but also it's going to have a bearing on things like liability caps in the vast majority of cases. So, you know, most liability caps will have some sort of relationship to the contract value through some sort of mechanism. And so you kind of need to know what the contract value is in order to assess that liability cap. When is it starting? When's it being done by? You know, if we are, if it's a quick sort of one off professional services engagement with a report at the end of it and it lasts two or three months, we're probably going to get less excited about it than if we are being asked to sign up to a five year deal. What could go wrong? In other words, what, what is the business owner worried about around this? And that's usually a good question to ask because they may not have thought about that. Equally importantly, what would we do if whatever the contract was for didn't work out or failed or went away? Have we got a backup plan? If the answer is yes, again, maybe we're not going to be so concerned about our remedies against the supplier, for example. Uh, an example of that I had recently where um, client was getting very excited about uh, liability caps on a contract to do a piece of data migration for them. Uh, and we, we asked the question and it turned out that IT were taking full backups and would be testing them and would be perfectly able to roll back if the migration didn't work without any real issue. So actually it wasn't a problem. I also suggest that you make sure the business owner understands that you're doing quick and dirty review. You want this is not a legal sign off on this contract. This is you having a look for any absolute howlers. If you can, it's a good idea to agree what issues you're actually going to look at. For example, if there are three things that the business owner actually cares about and the rest can go hang, maybe you can agree you'll only look at those three things. It's also a good idea to just do spend a minute doing a little bit of Googling about who the other side are. Uh, you know, you might turn up something like a, a horrendous data breach that they've just suffered or something like that. It's usually a good idea just to have a quick look. So that's our first five minutes. Next five minutes, we're still talking to the business owner. Now we give them their homework. So it will be their job to check all the commercials, by which I mean the description of the, the goods or the services that are being bought or sold, the quantities, how much you're paying, uh, the term or the delivery date. Uh, and if you can, try to push off any internal approvals onto them as well. So if if InfoSec needs to sign off or if finance needs to sign off on a on a credit risk or something, try to get the business owner to do it. Let's work for you. Right, now coming back to the basics. Uh, and 
it's always worth checking this stuff because you'd think this would go without saying, but you'd be amazed how many contracts actually don't do this. The number of sort of um, particularly large corporate customers standard terms that I see which spend so much time uh, setting out all the different ways that the customer doesn't have to pay that they forget to actually include a basic obligation to pay uh, or a, a basic obligation to supply the goods or perform the services. But even if that is in there, to, to what standard? Um, I mean, reasonable skill and care would be typical, but it's worth just making sure that there is something in there that says to what standard you expect performance to be delivered. Um, how long are we locked in for? Can we get out early? It, it's a, a common misconception amongst um, amongst non-lawyers that if you sign a four-year contract, you can actually get out of it early if you just want to. Uh, you can't unless the con if you sign a contract that has a four-year term, then unless the contract makes express provision for it or the other side, you know, breaches it sufficient in a sufficiently serious way, you're locked in for that four-year term. What's our maximum exposure? In other words, what's our what's our liability? Again, this is why you need to know the contract price. Equally, what's our maximum remedy? Make sure the business owner understands this and that they actually think about whether that is going to be enough of a remedy given the kinds of things that they have told you could go wrong. Does it renew automatically? If so, what are our notice periods and do those actually gel with us when we find out about renewal pricing. Uh, the number of particularly cloud vendor terms I see where you have to give 60 days notice if you don't want to renew, but they only have to give you 30 days notice of what the price will be on renewal. Uh, I mean, that just plain doesn't work. You need to know how much you're going to pay before you have to make a renewal decision. So it's always worth checking those basic things. Uh, and I apologize for David Meller, I couldn't resist. Right, now that we've checked that the contract's actually got the basics more or less right and it does what we need it to do, now we need to start looking for red, our red flags. So those might, depending on what sort of a contract this is, um, they, will be, they will differ. But if it's a sort of supply of goods or supply of services type of contract, then probably you're looking at strict time delivery obligations or no obligations as to time of, of delivery. Uh, you're looking at hidden costs or open-ended costs, uh, for example, time and materials type agreements uh, or agile contracts, particularly in the tech sphere, tend to be essentially time and materials with some, some fancy language around them. Is there any exclusivity in there or other clauses that restrict how you do business, like non-competes. Uh, is there a right to withhold payments or require refunds or are there very long payment terms? Is there a right to suspend delivery? Uh, is there a no-fault termination right? And if so, does that have costs attached to it? Uh, is there other provisions shifting a risk from one party to the other? Are there provisions which start grabbing the other side's IP uh, or slurping up the other side's data? Now, it's not to say that provisions that do this are necessarily wrong. Depending on what the contract is for, they might be entirely reasonable. But you should look for them and ask yourself the question. And the way to do that quickly is good old control F which is, I think, the lawyer's best friend. And up here on the slide, we've got some search terms, which I like to use to find those kinds of red flags. So for delivery time, you can search for deliver late essence, as in time is or is not of the essence. For hidden costs, you can search for pay, remit, reimburse, cost, expense. For exclusivity and that sort of thing, you can use search for exclus, you can search for sole, minimum, Pricing, which can lead you to something like an MFN clause, compete for competitor or competition. Um, 
Similarly, if you're looking for withholding payment, uh, you can search for any of those terms. Uh, risk shifting clauses tend to take the form of uh, indemnification that would be contractual indemnification though so they won't necessarily use the word indemnify uh, it's always so therefore worth looking for sort of reimburse defend harmless phrases like that uh, IP land grabs all the usual suspects assign uh, perpet for perpetual licensing foreground background all the terminology that tends to be used around clauses that shift ownership of intellectual property or grant very permissive licenses uh, data grabs that's typically dressed up as as aggregation or anonymized data so you can usually find it by searching for those terms and and so on uh, you'll get a copy of these uh, and these are just the ones i use i'm sure other people may very well have different search terms that they use but Control F really is your friend. What is not your friend is typically American lawyers uh, sending you password protected word documents. Uh, and uh, and this is just my opinion, not Erwin Mitchell's opinion, but if so, I think if someone sends you a password protected word document that tells you two things about them. Number one, they don't understand technology and number two, they're probably the sort of person to cause a fuss in restaurants. But that aside, um, it's actually completely trivial to remove. It takes about 30 seconds. You go into Word, you save the document as a rich text format document rather than a Word document. You open it up in a, in a plain text editor like Notepad or I prefer Notepad++. Uh, you search for the phrase password hash. Uh, here you can see it in the little picture. It'll be followed by a big string of letters or numbers. You highlight all that, delete it, save the file, reopen the RTF in Word, and then you'll find you can turn off any protection functions that were protected by the password, resave as a Word document, and go about your day. It takes 30 seconds. When you're trying to navigate particularly longer documents, it's usually a good idea to change your point of view. Now, if, you have, if you're lucky enough to have multiple monitors at home, Word does allow you to have multiple windows on the same document at the same time and on different screens. So you can just hit the little new window button up here and it'll open the same document in another window and you can shift it over to your other monitor. And for example, you can have the definition section on one screen and the clause you're looking at on the other. Um, if you don't have two monitors, you can achieve much of the same effect with the, the split button, which will uh, split your screen horizontally like this. Uh, or frankly, do what I often do and just print it out. Um, laser printers are cheap now. And frankly, you know, I paid less than 100 quid for a laser printer that does 30 odd pages a minute double sided. Um, it's changed my life from uh, a home working perspective. You can often run into formatting issues, particularly if you're dealing with someone else's document. And this seems a bit trivial, but you can actually lose a lot of time to this sort of stuff. Um, again, in, in American contracts, it's very common for liability clauses to be set out in all caps. And a US attorney did once explain to me that there are specific reasons for that, which means you can't get away from it, but they are practically impossible to read as a result. Um, triple click the clause go to this little thing up next to the uh, the font selection tool in Word, hit sentence case, and it just turns it into ordinary English sentences. It becomes much easier to read. You can always turn it back when you're done. Or if you're trying to add new clauses and again, you're working on someone else's paper and they've got their own styles and automatic numbering and what have you, just click on one that's got the numbering you want click the format painter and then highlight your clause, let go and bingo. It just applies all the formatting to that clause as well. Also, if you're pasting text into a document, don't just control V it because it'll take all the formatting with it and it'll, it'll possibly break the document. It'll certainly break the formatting and especially if you're working in track changes, uh, all hell can break loose. Always use Control and Alt and V, which then brings up this window and then choose unformatted text. That will then place just the bare text into the document and the document's own formatting will then apply to it. 
saves a huge amount of time faffing around with trying to fix formatting problems. Finally, uh, we all have to deal with PDFs from time to time. Uh, it is really worth getting your business to shell out to get you the full version of Adobe Acrobat. Um, and there are a few reasons for that. Uh, number one, it's really good at OCR, by which I mean taking just images of, of words on a page and turning them into searchable text. Uh, on a modern computer, OCRing even a, a long document takes seconds rather than minutes, and it then instantly enables you to use Control F and to search for particular terms. That's incredibly useful where, you know, you've got a, a renewal that's landed on your desk that's kind of got to be signed now. And there's a, a full on MSA that was signed like five, six years ago. And the only thing anyone can find of it anymore is a scanned PDF. This is where this saves you tons of time because you can make that scanned PDF searchable in, in under a minute. Equally, Acrobat Pro lets you take the sort of PDF standard terms that the other side have sent you and just export them to Word. Uh, you can also just pull out particular pages. One tip I would say is if you're going to copy text out of a PDF into a Word document, it tends to create really, really messy line spacing. You get this sort of nonsense here. Uh, there's a lovely little website called Text Mechanic, which will basically take all the pain out of that for you. It'll take out extraneous line breaks, it will remove extraneous formatting. If you just pass it through that, it saves you having to do it manually. So I have basically run out of things to say. What I'm now going to do is hand over to my colleagues, Alex and Steve, who are going to talk about slightly more lawyery things to do with ending disputes. There we are. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, Apologies again for the for the brief interlude there. So uh, I'm a, a disputes lawyer. I specialise in, ironically enough, IT disputes and intellectual property disputes. But I did spend uh, a number of years earlier in my career uh, working on large IT transactions, uh, and much of it was spent negotiating agreements for projects which had overrun on time, over on, on budget, or just changed massively uh, when it came to the scope of the project since the, the contract was first entered into. And both in my roles as a, a disputes lawyer and also as a transactional lawyer, I honestly can't remember a single significant IT project which came in on budget and on time. And I suspect that I'm, I'm not alone in that. And late and over budget, budget is obviously a recipe for dispute because of course, if something's late and over budget, it has to be somebody's fault, right? Uh, the problem with that is that the typical IT dispute is a hellish nightmare and it's a hellish nightmare for everybody involved. It's a nightmare for the customer because typically it will be embarking on a business critical IT project which needs to be implemented as soon as possible uh, to support growth or change projects uh, and all those plans get put on hold or they get obstructed if the IT isn't right. It's a nightmare for suppliers because typically they'll enter into the agreement, get into the into the project and realise that the customer's existing IT infrastructure or their requirements going forward aren't quite what they've been told uh, and they, they've got very different goalposts to those they expected. Um, and it's uh, a nightmare for the poor, poor lawyers who are tasked with um, navigating a clear path and being able to demonstrate without any, any ambiguity at all um, that it's the other side's fault. And why is it a nightmare? In IT projects, normally it's a nightmare because they're so factually dense. Um, typically, projects are quite extensive. Technically, they might be quite difficult. There are a lot of moving parts uh, and invariably what you get is conflicting evidence and conflicting accounts of what's gone wrong and why it's gone wrong. So whatever you throw at the other side, whatever evidence you may have, whatever emails you may have from the other side saying one thing, but then doing something else, they will be able to find something equally damaging, no doubt, which they can throw back at you. And the reason for this is they're typically tens if not hundreds of people working on a project, um, all of whom have been firing off emails left, right and centre, and there are thousands and thousands of emails to wade through and try to work out what's happened. So the inevitable result of that is that legal costs are eye-watering, um, they can seem endless uh, and disproportionate. From the internal, internal management perspective, 
equally it's a nightmare because so much management time gets sucked into dealing with the issue. Uh, but ultimately, you know, what what is the outcome of getting into a protracted uh, forensic debate about who did what and who didn't do what? Um, as a lawyers, as dispute lawyers, we encourage to think of the BATNA and the WATNA for any kind of course of conduct dispute resolution we, we embark upon. The BATNA is what is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement and the WATNA is what is the worst alternative to a negotiated agreement. And the reality is that with IT projects, most times there is no BATNA, it's all WATNA. If you don't manage to negotiate an outcome, you're going to be in trouble um, because the law and the legal system isn't flexible enough when it comes to the remedies which might be awarded to really solve the problem. So the question is, is there a better way to sleepwalking into the typical litigation oriented mindset when it comes to resolution of IT disputes? Um, the answer is that there can be. There can certainly be some things that you could try which would give you better leverage to achieve, achieve that good negotiated outcome. Uh, before we go on, um, what I would say is that a lot of what we're going to talk about is more from a customer perspective than a supplier perspective, but it, it's always useful from a supplier's perspective to know what the customer might be thinking. So uh, with that, I will hand over to my colleague Steve, who will um, talk you through our first top tip. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so I'm Steve Murphy. I'm uh, an associate and I work with uh, Alex on uh, some of the disputes that he's uh, been talking about. Uh, so tip one uh, that uh, I'd like to talk to you uh, about today, um, as uh, you can see uh, on the slide, it's uh, it, using the CPR, so the civil procedure rules in the court system, without committing yourself to um, obtain better leverage for negotiations. So the scenario I've got uh, in mind is one of those uh, project overruns. So where it's taking longer to deliver or implement a particular project. And this can be for many reasons, of course, but what we've uh, seen uh, examples of are the uh, sales representatives of suppliers uh, you know, promising whatever they need to to get the customer through the door. Uh, pre-contract before anything's signed um, and when it does uh, go wrong and uh, the customer starts thinking well hang on a minute I'm being asked to pay for extra uh, you know hours days weeks of time here then it's set out in the contract contract would be needed for the project to be implemented or delivered you know what what uh, claims might be uh, available to me so um, as Alex has said, getting into the nitty gritty of a breach of contract claim uh, can be very time consuming um, and costly. And so uh, what we've uh, tried to come up with is a different way in uh, circumstances where uh, there might be uh, another basis for a claim, which is misrepresentation. So the suppliers uh, in uh, IT contracts will uh, typically think that they've got the comfort and safety net of an entire agreement clause. So I'm sure you all know what uh, they are. Very common uh, in commercial contracts. It's, it's very rare to see a contract even on standard terms without one now. Um, but one thing that they generally do not cover is um, one type of misrepresentation called fraudulent misrepresentation. Um, and there are policy reasons for that, which I won't go into, um, but uh, any entire agreement clause will either have a carve out for fraudulent misrepresentation or it uh, will be in all likelihood unenforceable if it seeks to cover it. Now, fraudulent, fraudulent misrepresentation does sound like a very serious claim, and of course it, it, it can be in certain circumstances, but crucially, um, the burden of proof for it isn't actually dishonesty, so it's recklessness as to whether the statement is true or false. Now, how does this relate to what we're talking about? So in um, a, a dispute, in a scenario where there's a project that's gone over uh, time for implementation or delivery. It might well be that the sales representative has uh, said, yes, we've done lots of projects of a similar nature for uh, you know, businesses in, in the past and delivered them in, in X days. Um, we've also done uh, projects um, like this for your competitors or uh, businesses of a similar size and type. So I'm confident that this figure can be achieved. 
Now that figure might well be different to what's actually uh, set out in the contract and the supplier might be thinking, well, I can exclude uh, liability for those representations. Um, but the answer is that potentially they can't. And the way for um, a customer to use this as leverage for any negotiations that take place is to uh, ask for disclosure of uh, documents from the supplier um, to uh, essentially determine whether that representation made by a, a sales rep and what's set out in the contract um, is, is was correct or whether it was made I mean, indeed recklessly. So what they would be looking for is, for example, internal emails and correspondence between the sales and technical teams. So were the technical teams saying that this would take a lot longer than the sales teams were passing on to the customer and also contracts between uh, the IT supplier and other businesses um, that show how long a, a project of a similar nature um, would be delivered in and crucially evidence of whether that project was delivered within that time frame. Now, these are documents that uh, clearly a supplier is going to be very reluctant to disclose for lots of reasons. Uh, one of them being that you know, there are lots of uh, skeletons in the closet in terms of project overruns. It's it's uh, very common, as we've said. Reputational damage is another thing to think about if um, if it comes out that they have taken much longer uh, on on projects to deliver. Um, and this is really what gives uh, the customer leverage in negotiations. It's not necessarily um, any sort of uh, actual determination by a judge, but it's the threat of making this application or a hearing coming up. So it's it's uh, in, in procedural terms, it's called an application for pre-action disclosure. It's made under um, Rule 31.16 of the Civil Procedure Rules. There's a four part test that needs to be satisfied. The first three parts are uh, very likely to be in, in this scenario and the battleground will be the fourth part. So is it desirable to uh, for these documents to be disclosed pre-action to dispose fairly of the anticipated proceedings, assist the dispute to be resolved without proceedings or save costs? And one of the, the key things really that um, I'd like to stress on, on tip one is that making this application does not commit the party to issuing full blown court proceedings, doesn't commit them to going to trial or giving disclosure or detailed witness statements or anything like that. The risk is just making a standalone application and potentially having to pay the costs of that application itself. Um, the, in terms of costs, sometimes the applicant might have to pay and both parties costs, but if the documents have been have not been disclosed um, uh, and it's been unreasonable to do so, then um, you know they can actually be awarded their costs as well. So that's tip one. Uh, for, for today, use the civil procedure rules, use an application for pre-action disclosure or a threat of it to uh, for leverage uh, in uh, negotiations. I'll hand back to Alex for tip two. Thank you, Steve. So tip two is, is really all about incremental gains. And the temptation when you get into an IT dispute is to go in all guns blazing, with gloves off, be ultra aggressive, asking for absolutely everything you think that you're entitled to or your side is entitled to. Uh, the problem is that approach very rarely gets you anywhere quickly and it's very unlikely to get you everything you want even at the end of it. So the reality in most IT disputes, unfortunately, if you do find yourself getting into it, um, is that there aren't any, any real quick fixes. Uh, even if you think you've agreed a way forward at the start and you think we've killed this dispute, we've got what we wanted. The likely it is that as the project um, progresses, there'll be development problems or implementation problems and you find out you find that you're back in a dispute scenario anyway, or at least in a, in a very heated uh, negotiation trying to uh, renegotiate the agreement. So if you're going to be in it for the long, the long haul anyway, operationally you're going to be in the long game. You know that because you're in a long term project. Legally, you don't want to go to litigation. If you do, you're in it for the long term. So go for the alternative, which is the negotiated outcome. Accept that you're in the long game there as well and try to make incremental gains. And the first point to make in relation to that is, is the carrot versus stick point. We all, when we are under pressure and we feel it's somebody else's fault, we're all more likely instinctively to start waving a big stick uh, the more effective solution normally is to dangle a carrot. Um, now, 
it seems counterintuitive to offer something to the other side if you think they're not delivering and they're not doing something that you're entitled to. The, the clever part of dangling the carrot is to dangle it on a conditional basis. So you negotiate the improved position that you want in return for your conditional carrot, knowing or feeling that it's very likely um, that the other side are never going to meet the conditions to get their hands on that carrot in the first place. In that way, you negotiate your incremental gain. And whilst notionally you've given something away, the likelihood is that you don't ultimately end up giving something away unless there's been some really good performance on the other side. And if that's the case, actually whatever you've given away is likely to have cost you less than the alternative might have done. Uh, and, and the secret there is to, is to constantly, incrementally, whenever new issues come up, don't try and deal every, with everything in one go. Incrementally improve your position under the agreement by small changes to the contract. Try to win on points round by round rather than win on knock, win by knockout. And try to do that using the, the mechanics of the agreement, which invariably, invariably will include quite detailed change control and contract variation procedures. And the reason I suggest that is that if you're using the mechanics of the agreement rather than going putting a litigation mindset um, to the fore, you're likely to get a much better response from the other side and you're also likely to get a different team of people who are dealing with it. So if you use the mechanics of the contract change control mechanism, uh, you're likely to find that a contract manager will be dealing directly with the delivery team on the other side and they will work together to respond to your change control request and you will negotiate on a much more amicable basis than if you do go in all guns blazing and encourage the other side to refer it to litigation lawyers and particularly external litigation lawyers. I mentioned that on the slide there, bigger rewards deserve bigger risks. This is kind of the, the corollary to the carrot versus stick idea. Um, the more you offer, ideally on a conditional basis, the bigger risk the other side should be willing to take because they either see the pound signs or they see the benefit that they stand to gain. And they're more likely to concede your demands to um, amend the agreement in a way which can benefit you later down the line. Um, there are two ways of looking at it. You can look at the in-project advantages which you can negotiate on an incremental basis to improve your position in project as it as it um, is developed, as it's implemented. Uh, and at the same time, always have a, an eye towards the end game. So renegotiation, termination and exit provisions so that if ultimately you decide this isn't working, we do need to get out. You've incrementally and almost imperceptibly negotiated yourself into a position where you can get out and you can get all the assistance you need to get out and transition out of that relationship um, in an optimal manner. Adopting this incremental gains approach, in my experience, always gets a better outcome than litigation or all guns blazing styles of, of dispute resolution. And the reason for that is that you just get better engagement from the other side and you can you can make those improvements to your position almost imperceptibly before the other side realizes what's what's going on. And I will hand over to Steve to talk you through our final tip. Thanks, Alex. So I'll uh, we'll race through tip three. I know we're a bit pushed for time. So um, as you can see on the slide, I'm sure you're all familiar with ADR, so alternative disputes resolution. I'm sure you're familiar with mediation as well. And the reason we flagged this in the context of IT disputes is because uh, lots of uh, software can be business critical and it can be very difficult to exit from uh, these agreements. So where you need to um, negotiate something that it will uh, enable the parties to uh, work together into the future, potentially for years to come. Mediation is a non-adversarial process, so not like litigation. Um, and uh, it can be very useful uh, getting a third party, an independent third party involved who, whilst they're not going to make a, any decision or judgment on the facts, is not going to be interested in, to get, in getting into the nitty gritty of um, you know, who said what and what, what actual breaches have occurred, only in a very high level sense. And they'll want to focus on the bigger picture, the commercial objectives of the parties and their interest in avoiding you know, litigation, trial and that adversarial process. And mediation's got a very high success rate of settlement. 
So it's definitely worth considering where there's a relationship to salvage um, and the parties want to try and achieve a commercial outcome that everyone can live with. Um, the uh, Society for Computers and Law, who some of you are probably members of, um, have got a short form adjudication scheme um, which they've uh, launched. Um, it involves an adjudicator um, being appointed to make a decision on the dispute in a, a limited time frame. So it's three months from the appointment of the adjudicator. There are very strict limits on how long each party has to file um, what is uh, the document setting out their case and the replies to those. There are also limits on how long those can be and how many supporting documents can be included. It's quite a flexible process as well, so the adjudicator can decide whether it's necessary for a hearing to take place or whether further information uh, from a particular party is necessary. And one, one thing to note is that all of the adjudicators are tech law professionals, so I think they're mostly barristers at the moment on the panel. Um, so they've got lots of experience of these types of disputes and they will make, then make a decision um, which is binding um, uh, unless the parties commence arbitration or litigation within six months and they can award damages interests and costs. So that short form adjudication is worth thinking about if the uh, if, if the, it requires uh, someone who's familiar with these types of disputes um, to be involved for a decision to be made, but it's much quicker than the normal court process, which can easily take 12 to 18 months to get to trial. It might not be appropriate for the most complex disputes because of the timescales and limits on the documents um, involved, but it's definitely worth thinking about where it, that involvement um, of a tech law professional would be useful and the parties want to try and uh, speed things up. So that's tip three for today and I will now pass back to Dan. Who's still on mute? I think you need to unmute Dan. Right, sorry about that. Uh, I should now be off mute. Uh, if someone could give me a wave if that's true, that would be useful. Yep, brilliant, excellent. So, uh, a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, we have lots of these sorts of webinars uh, and other events going on. Uh, you can find pretty much everything uh, in the uh, under coronavirus updates uh, on our website at erwinmitchell.com. Uh, if there's anything that you wanted us to cover today that we haven't or you've got any questions, you can either ping us directly by email or you can shoot us a line to uh, events at erwinmitchell.com. Uh, and with that, uh, let's see, we have uh, a few questions, so let's have a look. What have we got? It would help if I could actually bring up the Q&A box. Uh, all right, well, I've, I think I've got them in chat as well. We will use that. Um, first one is just uh, an observation, which uh, I did ask for, uh, and it's a useful one, which is to when you're finishing off a contract to uh, search for square brackets uh, which is yep something I always do always a good idea before you send out an exact version um, and it does pick up a lot of last minute sins or or even just drafting errors where there's a, an election that hasn't been made or something like that uh, it's also a good idea to search for uh, broken cross references uh, something for error or something like that will usually bring it up or clause zero or paragraph zero uh, are the others that I'll normally do as pre-flight checks before a document gets signed. Um, we've also got a question relating to uh, data protection and uh, specifically whether we have a oh yeah, whether you whether you need to have a written agreement where one of the parties is a data processor. Um, the legal answer is that Article 28 requires a contract which meets certain specific requirements. Um, it doesn't say that has to be a written contract, but I'm not sure how you would evidence that it meets those specific requirements if it isn't written down somewhere. Um, in terms of search terms you can use to check for those, uh, data subject is a good one uh, because one of the requirements of Article 28 is that uh, you make provision for uh, the exercise of data subject rights. Um, security is another one, uh, or secure, or words to that effect, or measures, or appropriate, or really any of the uh, 
the kind of non-generic language that crops up in Article 28 will usually find that clause for you fairly swiftly. Uh, now, did we have any others? I don't, I think that is it for the moment. So I think all that remains to say is thank you all very much indeed uh, and uh, have a great day. <laughs>